We're looking at chapter 15 in a study called The Life of Samuel. <clears throat> this chapter deals with one of those hard days in the life of a, a teaching pastor. What he has to do today is going to be tough. Uh, Saul has come home full of victory and disappointment to the Lord. And Samuel has a responsibility to go and speak to the king on behalf of the Lord. <clears throat> uh, but Saul is not wacko yet, as he is the rest of the time in the Bible, but... <clears throat> The Sam in verse 24 <clears throat> tonight. Uh, there in this chapter 15, a discussion between three people. And, and it's well worth your time to read that chapter in regard to the three conversations going on. There's a conversation going on between the Lord and Samuel. And Samuel and Saul. <clears throat> Then there is a one going on with Saul to himself, <laughs> which are all interesting. In verse 24, Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned. Uh, you know, that's a good thing to acknowledge that, except he acknowledges it to the wrong person. He never does acknowledge that to God. Now, to God. Several times he acknowledges it to Samuel. Let me tell you, all sin is against God first. Then we'll sort out how it plays down into the lives of people, right? Because personal sin affects a lot of, lot, lot of people a lot, a lot of different ways. But what he should be saying is, I have sinned against you, O Lord, in heaven, Kind of, like, kind of like David in Psalms 51. He's not going to do that. He's not going to do it now, and he's not going to do it later, and I don't know that he ever does it. <clears throat> but anyhow, <clears throat> Saul says to Samuel, I have sinned. I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words because I feared. Now he gives an excuse for not obeying the Lord. And let me tell you, they won't work. It will not work. The Lord isn't interested in that. Why? He's interested in the confession of the sin, but he's not interested in excuses. He wants you to clean your act up. <clears throat> because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now, that part's true. That's how he got in trouble. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin... See who, see who he's asking? Yeah. He's asking the prophet. <clears throat> and return with me. Now watch this. This is why he's asking him to forgive him and return with me. In other words, uh, to, the, you know, to the city in victory. Go with me to the, you know, he met him out here. And now I need to go. I want to go into the city and receive my rewards and victory. Uh, return with me that I may worship the Lord. I don't know how that's going to work. Let me tell you, that's a Sunday deal right there. That's what you deal with on Sundays right there. They go out, sin against God all week, and then come and worship him on Sunday and think because they came and worshiped him on Sunday that somehow that makes it all, all okay. This is the way this guy thinks right now. Do you understand that? I can disobey God, and then I can go worship him. That ain't going to happen. You can, go, you can go and go through the fundamentals, but that's not worship. Uh, that I may worship the Lord. Samuel, Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. Samuel, as Samuel turned to go, Saul seized the edge of his robe, the hem, the edge is the hem, 
of his robe, the border, the bottom, and tore it. Samuel turned and said to him, The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today, and it has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. And also the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. In other words, he's had this discussion with him earlier about you've rejected the Lord and this is the final time. He's been doing it consistently. And now this is it. He said, I have sinned. Right? We got that again. Please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel and go back with me that I may worship the Lord your God. And Samuel does that. And then after that is done, verse 35, Samuel did not see Saul again until the day of his death, for Samuel grieved over Saul, and the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and I'm going to do a study on this, the kingdom torn from Saul. <laughs> well, I would say that you would have to sing a song, but I'm going to skip that since that's Al. That's, I, don't, I think I'll take a song from Al. <laughs> Let's have a word of prayer. Be sure you exercise your privilege as a believer priest to confess sin to the Lord. <clears throat> Mental attitudes and sins of the tongue and avert sin should be confessed in silence and privacy prior to study. You've got to study the Bible. It's a spiritual book for spiritual people. You have to study it under spiritual conditions. That is under the ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. 1 John 1, 9 would be after you examine your sin, if you're aware of mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, overt sins, 1 John 1, 9 could be applied to that. If I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive me and cleanse me. So take a moment for that. That's true with those who are visiting with us on the internet, I expect that from you as well as classroom, classroom protocol. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful today for these that have come to study with us both by automobile and by internet. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister because they understand the procedure is introduced in our study of how this is a spiritual book for spiritual people under spiritual conditions, learning takes place. It cannot be studied by human IQ or flesh or carnality. It must be studied under the ministry of the Holy Spirit to get spiritual truth. Jesus said, you will know the truth. We will never know it apart from the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the church age. You will know the truth and truth sets you free. Tonight, we need to understand that principle. Saul, his life as a believer is operating by cosmos diabolicus lies. That's because Jesus said in John 8, 44, 32, he said, truth will set you free. In 44, he says, but the devil is, will feed your head with lies. He is the father of lies. He is a liar. And so it is important for us to get this tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, to go back to our, our lesson text, which is uh, chapter 15, 24 through 30, I broke it down for you to take a look at the way I look at it. Uh, in verses 24 through 26, I saw the sin of Saul. It was called the transgressions in that, that, those verses, the transgressions of God's commands. He has previously said that to him in verse 11. He says, Samuel says to Saul, the Lord, this is what the Lord has said, that you have turned your back from following me by not carrying out my commands. And this has been a pattern in his life with the Lord. And so we've already had this idea stated. In verses 27 to 28, there's a symbol 
in the tearing of Samuel's robe to his message. He tears it and Samuel uses it as a visual aid symbol of God tearing the kingdom from him. That, you know, sometimes visual lessons that are pretty strong, aren't they? Um, so I'm sure that, and, and let me tell you, I'm going to explain to you, but there is another point later in the history between David and Saul when this, when the hem of the garment comes back into play. And it would be really interesting. And then I saw in verse 29 a reminder of the sovereignty of God. In verse 29, he says, Samuel says, and also the glory of Israel will not lie. Isn't it interesting how he refers to God here? The glory of Israel, because that glory was so important to Saul because of his low self-esteem, and that comes from cosmic thinking. Low self-esteem, it doesn't come from natural birth. It doesn't come from anything else but cosmic thinking. When it's in a believer's life, there's no room for that. Anyhow, he calls him the glory of Israel will not lie or change his mind, for he is not a man that he should change his mind. He is sovereign God. He's a sovereign God. When he comes down, when he lays something out in your life, he has thought this out so far. Listen. This whole thing started in eternity past at the Eternal Life Conference. Before the foundation of the earth, Ephesians 1. Before the foundation of the world, they, he laid this whole thing out. So when it comes, listen, when it comes time to your life, and this episode comes down on a certain day, a certain hour, a certain place, certain yada, yada, this thing has been well thought out by God. I mean, you should honor the sovereignty of God by being obedient to the word of God. Saul hasn't been doing that. And listen, the sovereignty of God when it's working out in our life is based on the truthfulness of God. And the truthfulness of God in regard to his sovereignty will over your life is based on his veracity and his immutability. And we see that in this thing. I mean, his mind works by truthfulness and, and he's immutable. He going to change his mind on it. And we've discussed this. Sacrilege mind of Saul is important. It's important to the Lord. Me, he has a worldliness thinking, a tabloid worldliness thinking. Everything he it's condensed. It's sensational. And it's just episodes. He never, look, listen, God wasn't, God didn't give him a general view of the directive will. He went into details. He used a, a key word in the Hebrew. He said, utterly destroy them. And he went even into detail. He, he named the categories. He laid it out. Now, if you don't have the time to talk about it, Right? Lord, Lord can send somebody else to do it. In the end, he had to send somebody else to do it anyhow. Right? I mean, Samuel wind up having to do it. But Saul thinks that he can carry out a small part portion of the will of God and be okay with God. That's not true. Not when he lays out the details of the directive will of God. I tell you, this has really been hot on my soul, hasn't it? I've been, I've been really on to this subject. The Lord has been pounding this into my soul. And I just can't get away from it. Now, that tells me that probably 90% of this is for me <laughs> and 10% of, 10 of it is for you when he starts pounding that stuff. But I'm telling you, I can't begin because, listen, most of you in here have been with me more than a year some of with, with you, my life. We are way beyond the, the general view of a directive will of God. We're into detailed studies. And that level is required for you. You can't, 
You can't tabloid the will of God in your life, shorten it down into little episodes and play with it and move it around and jockey it to fit your whims because he'll come down on you like thunder. That's what I'm getting. I, I'm that Samuel guy where he's giving me heads up to give down there, and I'm thinking, boy, I better have my ducks in a row. And we have been looking at different episodes where men who knew better, Moses, for example, right? He got whacked. You know why? Because more he knew more, more was expected. He had the maturity. You know, I, I think I think it's important that we we gather that. Now, why does he have this what I call a tabloid mentality? It condensed and sensational. All everything's drama. Why? Because in verse seventeen. Samuel put his finger right on his problem. Samuel put his finger right on his problem when he said, your problem is you think you're little in your own eyes. This is how you view yourself. You've got to change that. I'm telling you, I, don't, I can't begin to tell you how many Christians I meet like this. And, that, and listen, they've believed a lie. They're operating from a cosmic lie, a worldly lie from the pit of hell that, that is Satan. How you view yourself is very important as a believer. Well, my lesson comes down to five points over this Statement made in the 15th chapter, verse 27, 28. As Samuel turned to leave, Saul seized the edge of his robe, the hem of his garment, and he tore it. That's a nifel and perfect. The nifel is a intense passive. Now, let's see. Nifel, it's a simple passive. Nifal is a simple passive. The passive shows intent. His intent, he grabbed him. And the word seized at point one. So I'm not going to go into it, but that, this is really important in here. Well, when he for him, it's a nifal imperfect, which imperfect is continuous action. I mean, he was ready to rip, rip that thing off from him. That, that's the nifel and perfect. He was willing to rip that off from him. Uh, and I'll talk about it in a moment. The Lord has torn. He uses the same word, but this time puts it in the cow perfect. And that's why he says, and he won't change his mind. The Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to a neighbor who is better than you. Let's talk about this Saul seizing the robe. This word to seize in the Hebrew, I, and I wrote it there and wrote it in the Hebrew for you, right? Did I write it on your paper? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, Kazakh, it's as I, it, and, and the word seized is a hifil imperfect. In other words, the hifil here is going to show that he is emotionally charged. He's all revved up. forceful seizing of his robe and he tore the edge which is the extremity of the robe or the hem word wing because sometimes this used as an extremity like a, a wing or, or, or a limb you know like speaking of the body this is a garment of Saul's robe so In the Nifel, it shows intent when he says, and he tore. Saul seized the robe and tore it. You put the word seized in the, in the, uh, in, uh, the Hifil, and you put the 
emotionally charged guy here. I mean, he's revved up. I mean, he's ready to pull that, he's ready to pull that garment right off him. If And it gives you a peek into Saul. Saul's forceful seizing of Samuel was leaving was a hand warning that people use it all the time. People use it all the time. Saul, where do you think you're going? Get back here right now or else. This is a mentality. If this is in your life, you need to do some radical changing. Because this is old man flesh carnality operation. This is not spiritual. This is not godly. This is not right. This is operation flesh of the sin nature and carnality. This is the opposite. In Galatians 5, 16, 17, walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill the desires of the flesh. Verse 17, the desires of the flesh are in opposition to the spirit. When this kind of behavior goes on in a relationship between Saul and Samuel or between you and someone else, you are out of line. This is flesh. This is Operation Old Sin Nature. And this is a way to try to control. It's a control method. And it doesn't work. It causes more damage than it does anything else. It's, it's to promote a fear tactic. This is unacceptable behavior in a believer's life. Unacceptable. And listen, how do I know he was revved up? He grabbed Samuel's robe. That's the, that is God's mouthpiece, and he knows it. And he's a guy that can whip up in you one moment and want to make love to you the next. He does this and turns around and says, now you'll go with me, won't you? Let me tell you people, this is unacceptable behavior in a believer's life. And listen, you're not going to change by studying the Bible. You're going to change when you let the Bible study you and you make the changes. This is unacceptable. This is cosmos diabolicus thinking in the life of a believer. And I can tell you from my story today of Samuel and Saul, this is unacceptable. In 1 Corinthians, the third chapter and 3, they tell you that when you're in this fleshly state, you're carnal. This is carnality working and nothing good comes from carnality. This is operation carnality. And you say, well, it doesn't happen very often. It shouldn't happen at all. Well, I, I, I only have these every once in a while when they really don't, when they, Romans 13, 14 gives you a clue how to get this under control. Watch this. Let's go to Romans. I want, I want you to open your Bibles to Romans. I want you to look at 13, chapter, verse 14, what Paul says about this. Now, he says a lot about it everywhere, but I haven't got time to look at all this up. But 13, 14 is important. Listen, here's, here's what you got to do. You got to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Your life as a believer in Christ, as a spiritual maturing believer, and quote, a spiritual mature believer, 
your responsibility is to reflect the life of Christ from within inside you. People, when they contact you, they should contact Christ in you. Even when they're disgusted and angry and mad, they need to meet Christ. Saul is upset. Saul is angry. Saul is emotional. He's laying it all out there. And it's all wrong. So he says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ first. Secondly, how do I do it? Holy Spirit first. How do I put on Lord Jesus Christ? You got to get your flesh under control so you walk in the Spirit. Number two, number two, you've got to make changes. You've got to make changes. You've got to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. You've got, listen, that's Romans 12 too. That's Ephesians 4, 22 through 24. You've got to put him on. You got to put him on when the flesh is romping and roaring. It's easy to put him on when everything's going good, when everything's hunky dory and, and, and everything's going my way. When everything's going my way, not the highway, then I can be good. Let me tell you, you should be able to operate under this under any extreme because of the indwelling grace ministry of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. Now, you've got to get, get a hold of this stuff in your life. You've got to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make sense for the flesh. Listen, here's what he's saying. Stop making provision. Who makes these provisions for the flesh to operate this way? You do. It's volitional. I'm going to show you another one. Because we like to quote 1 John 1, 9 around here. And sometimes we miss 1 John 1, 8. Which is a big verse compared to confession. In the Greek language, this is an a priori argument, and verse 8 and 9 go together. In verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, that sin nature flesh, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, where'd that come from? Come from verse 8. We have a sin nature. And we sin, so stop deceiving yourself about sinning. Well, you know, it's part of life. Everybody does it. Come on now. Yeah, except you pick and choose. You pick and choose. You're like going to, through the market. You pick and choose. That pick and choose is where your problem is. Why don't you pick and choose to be spiritual? When you pick and choose your sins, you're in the flesh when you ought to be in the spirit. And listen, you've been in the flesh a while and you shouldn't be making provisions for it. You're making provisions for it. And you're in this inner dialogue with yourself to tell you who, what you're talking. What are you telling yourself should be the big clue? Well, I'll tell you, I'll just... That's just about how inner dialogue goes. Listen, what Saul is doing, diabolic is, listen to me, conformity to worldly insecurity, flesh. There's no such thing as insecurity in the ministry of the Holy Spirit. There's no such thing. Listen, his is secure. His is seal. No insecurities in the Holy Spirit. When you're, in, when you're into your insecurities uh, and have to prove your whatever by bouncing all over people, your insecurities because you're in your flesh. So, here we are in Romans 12 2. Let's look it up. I want your eyes on it. I, you think you know it. Maybe you do, Saul. 
Maybe you do. But maybe you know it in general and not in detail. And you're going to get whacked on details. So he says, do not be conformed to this world. Stop that. Now, you're the only person who can stop it. And how do I know that I'm in it? Well, it's obvious when you're in it. If you're not sure, then ask the people that are involved with it with you, and they'll tell you. Samuel told Saul. And he didn't like it. Stop being conformed to this world. There's nothing good for the Christian life in, in the world. Stop being conformed to the world. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of God is that is good, acceptable, and perfect. That's the name of the game. Now listen, you're going to be in one of these two areas. And you may spend a great deal of time in transformity. Listen to me now. You shouldn't spend any time in conformity. The only time you're dealing with conformity is to get rid of it, to replace it, to exchange it by renewing of your mind. And listen, if you're a spiritual mature believer, this stuff ought to be going on in your life on a regular basis. I'm talking about a regular basis where the Lord is pointing out stuff in your life that says, this got to go. And other people are giving you big hints about it too. There are Samuels in your life that are telling you these things and you're not listening. You're not listening to the truth of the voice of God. You don't want to hear it from them. But they're the closest and know the most because it's affecting them. But you're not listening. And listen, he tells them, you know what your problem is? You don't listen to the voices that speak the truth to your life. You don't listen to the voices that speak the truth. And I'll tell you, if there's any truth being spoken tonight, it's being spoken. And it's being spoken for change. Here's the second thing. David, now I want to show you the difference between old man thinking and new man thinking. I'm going to show you the difference. David will cut off the edge of Saul's royal robe in a cave among the rocks of the wild goats. I just had to put that in there. I mean, that's too good to be true. And you all remember this story probably when Saul was on his was trying to hunt David down to kill him and stopped to go to the restroom. So he went into a cave, put guards, went into a cave in which David and his men were in. David snuck up and cut the hem of his royal robe off, the royal robe that was off from him sitting over here because he was doing his business and cut a, and cut the hem of his robe cut the hem I mean does not life come back cut the hem cut the an edge of the hem of the royal robe of Saul I mean do you think there's not a picture in his mind of, of this and not only that but when Samuel said that the kingdom is going to be, you tore my garment. God has torn the kingdom from you and has given it to a neighbor that is better than you. This is the, this is the fulfillment of that prophecy. The neighbor is David, who has been anointed to be the king. Who's cut that off? And his soldiers are upset with him because they wanted him to kill, kill him or take him captive and, and stop this nightmare. You can read about this in 1 Samuel 24. It'll take the whole chapter, but it's tabloid, so you'll enjoy it. What you see is the difference is the way these two guys handled Similar situations. David said to his men, David, Oh, this is the day which the Lord has said. 
Behold, I'm about to give the enemies into your hand, and you shall do to him as it seems good to you. They said, you know, this is the day the Lord has made. <laughs> I mean, what are the luck that we stopped and this came and this guy came and this. I mean, how good. This is a bird in a cage. And David gave him a Bible lesson. That's what new man does, gives him a Bible lesson. Gave him a great Bible lesson. Here's what he said to his men. Here's his Bible lesson. So he said to his men, Far be it from me because of the Lord that I should do this thing to my Lord, the Lord's anointed, to stretch out my hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. He still holds the position. Well, there's some honor right there. You know why? This, this is new man thinking. Now, listen, if he'd have been an old man, he'd have had him. He'd have snuffed him out in a heartbeat. And, and anybody didn't want him to be the king when he was stepped out of that cave, his men would killed. And that was their day. They said, listen, this is the day the Lord has made. And he said, no, it isn't. Don't be deceived by what you see. And you know what he did? Listen, for all common sense in the whole wide world and military strategy would have said, boy, this has been our day. But see, it, it wasn't true with the Word of God. David stuck with the Word of God. He didn't go with emotions. He didn't go with, with what would be military strategy. He went with what was, what was the truth of the will of God. That's, this, is a powerful, this is a powerful moment in the life of David. And just think of all the, listen, who do you think stuck him? Who do you think set that whole rendezvous up? in the cave among the, what was this, among the rocks of the wild goats. You know, you know why they were there. They were probably eating some of those mountain goats. Well, that was hunting ground. I mean, God set that whole thing up. Let's test David. Let's test David and see if he's a man after my own heart. Hoo-ah. Three. Greek word for edge is interesting. In the Greek language, it's karasendon. I wrote it on your paper for you. It's at point three. It was used with some of the miracles performed by Jesus. There's one I really like. And so I want you to go to Matthew with me. I'm in close to it, Matthew, the ninth chapter, in a really interesting story. It's a famous story, and you're very familiar with it. In the ninth chapter, Jesus has come off from the Galilean tour, is back in Jerusalem, in verse 18. Uh, and there was a synagogue official who came to him. This is recorded in Luke and Mark in more detail. And he says, my daughter has died, and I need to have you come. Put your hands on her so she may live. Uh, his name is, in, uh, in some of the other uh, books, is Jairus. And, and the story goes that they're on their way. Jesus said, all right. And Jesus rose and began to follow him as well as his disciples. Then we meet, listen, this this is so good. Listen, this is a ministry on a way to ministry. Listen. If you're on a way to ministry, don't pass up ministry opportunities on your way to minister. Don't miss somebody at the airport. Don't miss somebody at the, at the service station. Don't miss somebody at the ticket booth. Don't miss somebody on the plane. Don't miss somebody at the restaurant. You understand what I'm saying to you? This is a story about a ministry on the way to minister. Verse 20. There was a woman who had been suffering with a hemorrhage disease for 12 years. She came up behind him. There's a large crowd. And touched the, the hem or the fringe of his garment, of his cloak. That's the hem of the garment. 
she was saying to herself, that's in her dialogue. She was saying to herself, and listen, this, this inner dialogue was so important to her healing. Listen, faith must always have a working object, and that working object must always be compatible with the will of God. Here's her inner dialogue. If I only touch his garment, I shall get well. Now, I'm going to explain why that's important to her. That's Jewish custom. She's pulling out the word of God out of Jewish, out of, out of the word of God of the old covenant. Jesus turning and seeing her, and, and she does. The rest of the story says she does. And he says, who touched me? And, and, the, and he's asked the disciples, and they go like, are you crazy? I mean... They, in some of the other past, in the other books, they tell you more more about this. And he turns around, and she he says, "Somebody touched me. I wonder who it was." And so she comes, and he says, and and she doesn't say what she says. You have to read the others. Daughter, take courage. Your faith has made you well. And at once the woman was made well. And Jesus went on his way. Now he's back, he's back headed to a ministry uh, for Jairus. Look, I want you to write this down. I want you to write it down. I, I lift you a little space there at the bottom. I got an outline. Three H's. Hemorrhage, which is it's on your paper if you need to spell it. Just put it up there for now. Hemorrhage, hem, and healing. Her hemorrhage is described, put a line out there next to the word hemorrhage, is described as incurable. She has an incurable disease. She's had it for 12 years. She spent a fortune on medical expenses. But he says, we can't help you. This is a terrible disease that she has. Because of this, Leviticus 15 declares her unclean. which has, not, has taken her out of a whole social, religious, whole deal, hasn't it? Okay? That's in verse 20. See, when she comes to Jesus, by law, she's got to declare herself unclean. That probably cleared a little path out for her. She may have whispered it. She may not have shouted it like she was supposed to, but she, this is part of protocol. The hymn... She's after the hem of his garment. And she believes that if she touches it, she will be healed. She's, she says that. That's, that's what, you know, if, if that's what she said to go to, 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 she heard Jesus was in town. That's what motivated her to go. This inner dialogue is what's motivating her to work her way through the crowd. Listen, this disease, this disease, left you absolutely weak all the time. This, this is a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of energies being expended to get to that place. Uh, she came to that week, and more she goes, the weaker she gets on this deal. To touch the hem of the garment um, is quite a task. But listen to her for what her faith said. Listen to what she believed. She believes that if I touch the hem of her garment, what, what did she believe? I will be well. I will get well. I will be well. Okay? Her inner dialogue, her inner dialogue about this whole thing, I, I don't know if I went into any more discussion on this. Her inner dialogue, this comes out of, out of places um, in the Old Testament. Um... I didn't write those down, I don't think. Oh, numbers. Yeah, numbers. Uh, listen, go, I, 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 well, later you do it. I haven't got enough time to But later, I'm going to tell you what to put down. Later, go back and look at this. I can tell you, it's going to tell you all about the tassels. Okay? This is what she's after. Uh, she's after 
grabbing any one of the blue, blue tassels on each corner of the garment. That's what she's after. N write this down. Numbers 15, 37 through 40. And it tells you why that's important. Why they wore it based on the word of God. The, these were symbols. People believe certain things about God. Everything is real. But these tassels represented um, the importance of categorical Bible doctrine being inhaled and exhaled every day of your life. This, these tassels represented, they were of your faith in 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17. This is what she's after. This is what she's after. And she believes that. And she believes it because this was Bible doctrine. It was the directive will of God. If she could get there and, and, and touch the hem of his garment, if, he, if she was aware that he's a man of God, he's going to have these. I mean, he's going to have these blue tassels. <coughs> it's, 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 so sometimes we lose some of that. Stuff, but this is verse 20 and 21. She was absolutely convinced. In her, in her dialogue. And then the healing. Incomp this is incomprehensible trust. To your faith. James 2, 18. I will show you my faith. What she teaches us, daughter, take courage, present active imperative. That's a command. Daughter, take courage. What you have demonstrated here today, demonstrate every day of your life. You are on the right track. You know what he's saying when he says to take courage? He's saying, you have made my day. Not that I healed you, but that I saw your faith heal you. Your faith healed you today. And when he says take courage, he says what you have discovered today is the secret for your life every day. You walk by faith and not by sight. Daughter, daughter of Israel, take courage. Your faith has made you well. And at once, immediately, the woman was made well. <laughs> what is interesting is the word made well. It's sozo. It's S-O-Z-O. -O. It is a word for salvation or deliverance. So we use the word so much for salvation, we don't realize it has other meanings like deliverance. Your faith. Daughter, your faith. Daughter of Israel, your faith has delivered you this day. This is a great day for you. Every day should be this way. Take courage, he puts it in the imperative. That's a great, that's a great, that's a great lesson on the hem of the garment. <laughs> Four. Back to Saul. The sin that resulted, that was a little mini sermon for me. The sin that resulted in the kingdom being torn from Saul, listen to me now, was a repetitive sin. Be aware of repetitive sins. Because 1 John 1, 9 will, will re restore you from the sin, but will not remove the repetitiveness of it. You've got to correct the repetitiveness of the sin. You understand that? Because that's connected to your old man thinking. It was a repetitive sin that Saul was unwilling to address and put off. 
He didn't even go to 1 John 1, 9. He didn't even go there. He didn't even go there. That's not an issue in his life. Because he he's not, un, he, listen, he's unwilling to deal with it. Listen, every, if he has to confess his sin, and it's a repetitive sin, then that tells him you have a standing problem in your life. And you can't blame it that I have a sin nature because, listen, yes, you have a sin nature. Yes, you are flesh. But you have the third member of the Godhead who lives in your life to control it. Agreed? Uh, this is a repetitive problem, and the Lord through Samuel has been telling him repetitively, repetitively that this is a problem. He told him that in 1 Samuel 13, 13, and 14, in the 15th chapter, verse 11. This has been a constant theme that the Lord has been speaking to Saul over through Samuel, through his preacher. But Saul has been unwilling, even when told, even when told repetitively, and even unwilling when he was told in the final encounter with, Saul, with Samuel. He still didn't do it. Sa Samuel lays it right out for him. Samuel says, let me tell you where your problem is. And he wasn't willing to make any changes. You ask, how is this possible? He's a, he's a spiritual mature believer. How is this possible? And the answer seems too simple. Saul just needs to do everything the Lord tells him to do without question. You understand that? Just do. Do the do. Right? Do the do. It's the same thing Adam and Eve did. Sure. Well, he does we're all guilty of this. It's how long are you going to stay guilty of it? Why don't you change it? Is it possible? Absolutely. Put off the old man and put on the new man. Ephesians 4. How? How do I do that? New and empty. How was that? Just more study? No. It's putting on, taking off. That's the renewal. You, you got to take it off and put on the Take this false belief off and put the truth of the word of God on. And start letting it be an exercise. It's not done by the power of the flesh. It's done by the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, the answer the, to solve this problem in this man's life is simple. He doesn't have to go to 13 psychologists for uh, 13 years to get this solved. This is a simple solution. Do the will of God. Do it to the letter. When he tells you this is wrong, change it. Make changes in your life. You'll be amazed how God will work with you and how he won't work with you until you do that. You wonder, well, I wonder why my life is not going this way. Why, is that, why don't I do this? How come I don't have this? And how come I don't have it? I tell you, clean your, listen, clean your closets. Your house looks okay, but your closets are terrible. How about cleaning some closets? In 1 Samuel 15, 19, listen to this. Now listen closely. I wrote it on your paper. Why then did you not obey? Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord? Listen, these buts where excuses are given, it doesn't matter what the excuse is. The point is the but. Now that's just with one T and it ought to be with two. <laughs> It's not what the excuse is. It's the fact that there is a but. Why did you not obey, but why did you rush upon the spoils, and why did you do what was evil in the sight of the Lord? You know why? Old man cosmos diabolic is thinking. He didn't do, listen, he could have he done, do the do. Listen, all you got to do is fulfill what God told you. Just go do what God told you to do. Right? I mean, how simple. I mean, this is not complicated. You don't have to have a theology degree or a degree in psychology to figure this out.
Just go do it. The problem that needs to be addressed and changed is attached to this but, which is in opposition to the directive will of God, the details of it. Oh, he said, I went and won the war. What are you talking about? He said, I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the details. And because you didn't do all of the will of God, you didn't do any of it. How, what do you think about that? Whew. I don't want to hear that. Saul's repetitive sin is labeled by Samuel. His repetitive sin has now been identified and described as rebellion, as a sin of divination, insubordination, as the sin of iniquity and idolatry, and the transgression that is identified as rejecting the word of the Lord. You think that's not strong? I mean, if you went to a counselor and he told you that, you would never come back again and pay a hundred bucks to hear him. Whatever they charge. The whole thing is really simple. This is not complicated. Do the do. Do what God tells you to do. And things will go better in your life. Do what God tells you to do. Do all the details. Don't, don't, don't take the general and then say, well, I'll do this and I'll do that and it'll be okay. Wasn't okay with Saul. Listen, Samuel said, listen, this is really strong. Sacrifice. He said, you know what your problem is? You don't listen to obey the voice of the Lord. You hear it and then decide how you're going to change it. How you're going to be able to work his will into your life and still do what you want to do. That ain't gonna, he's not going to accept that. He throws the whole thing out. You need to listen to this when he talks to Saul. He threw the whole thing out. Listen to me. Saul is battling his core of old man, cosmos diabolicus formerly of the world thinking. Saul is battling. Right here, there is a... Listen, Saul has a chance to clean this whole deal up. The battle has gone from outside to inside. And every bit of it is being exposed. Every bit of it. The war has gone from out here with the Abimelechs to the inside between Saul and God. Samuel has brought the fight out in. Samuel has brought it out and in. And Saul is battling his core of lies that he tells himself and justifies them and defends them. It's called conformity of worldly thinking. You got to get rid of it. Just like Paul says in Romans 12 too, do not be conformed. Stop doing this. Stop being conformed to the world and start being transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is that is good, acceptable, and perfect. That's how simple this fix is. This is not complicated. This is an easy fix. Do the do. In this, when Samuel brought the battle in side to Saul, between Saul and the Lord, Samuel revealed and put his finger on the very cause, the very core of Saul when he makes two statements to him. Watch what he does. I mean, this is really masterful. He wants, listen, he wants better than anything in life for, for Saul to get right with the Lord and this thing come out good. We still have an opportunity to pull this out of the fire. Your life doesn't have to go west on this thing. I, I'm tired of having it go south, so I, t I sent it west. In 15.7, Samuel, Samuel says to Saul, is it not true? And listen, if he would have accepted this, we'd have been on the right road. Is it not true, though you were little in your own eyes, God 
made you the head of the tribe of, of, of Israel and the Lord anointed you king over Israel? How is it, Saul, that God saw something in you that he was willing to promote and you demoted? Do you not realize you torpedoed yourself? Do you not realize you did this to yourself because you have this view of who you are? A view that God doesn't hold to. Now listen to me. Who you are in Christ is the truth. Who you are in the world is a lie. Now that you've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, now that you have come to be saved through the power of the gospel where he died, buried, and raised for you. Right, Romans 1.16, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Listen, if that power is enough to save you, it's a power to change your life forever. Listen, who you are in Christ is everything. And if you don't know those 20 status privileges, you're missing a privilege for your life. I laid down 20 status privileges of who you are in Christ, and you need to learn them in that 50 things you should you receive at salvation. You should memorize them. You should learn these because that's who you really are. This, all the stuff you tell yourself every time you get in a funky mood and you say, well, I'll never amount to anything. I'm not this and I'm not that. Or I'm bigger than life and everybody, I, uh, whether, you know, you go, I'm bigger than life or smaller than a thimble. Listen, don't listen to these lies and don't talk these lies into your soul. Listen, you need to know who you are in Christ and live that person out under the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, you are a child of God. You are a child of light. You are a child of promise. You are a member of the royal family of God. You are the beloved. You are the chosen. You are righteous at all times in the eyes of God. You're an ambassador. You're a priest. You're an heir with an inheritance. You're a member of the body of Christ, the church. You're a bond slave of Christ. You are a saint. You're a citizen of heaven. Set your mind on these things that are above Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Quit setting your mind about who you are on the things of the earth. That is not who you are anymore. You've been saved. You've been redeemed from that. Enough's enough, isn't it? How long are you going to carry this dead man around making decisions for you? It's time to get rid of him. Have a funeral and get rid of him. Get rid of him. This thinking has been part of Saul's core that he has struggled with his entire life and now it's only going to get worse. He's had every opportunity to make real change in his life. In 1 Samuel 16, 14, he had the Holy Spirit and now it's going to be removed. Listen, the Holy Spirit is where the power is for change. Stop trying to think you can figure all this out with your head. It's not willpower. It's Holy Spirit power. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that takes the will of God and pounds it into your core of who you are. Jeez. We make stuff so difficult. In 2 Timothy 2.26, it says, Come to your senses. Escape from the snare of the devil who is trying to hold you captive to do his will. Listen, come to your senses and escape from the snare. It's a grace escape. But no, we stay in there. That's our comfort place. And it is a trap of doom. Who you are in Christ is not a work project of reform from conformity. I'm so tired of reform your life. 
Well, you Christians, you just need to reform your life. I'm not talking about trans. I'm talking about transformation. I'm not talking about reformation. You can't reform out of conformity. Reformation is part of conformity. It's the world system. You've got to get in transformation by the renewing of your mind. You've got to learn it, and then you've got to exercise it. You've got to make changes in your life by the power of the Word of God. Jeez. Listen, you need to be a product of God's grace transforming you into the new man of Christ. You'll know when you're on that journey because you'll stop spending so much time talking to yourself in inner dialogue and you'll spend more time talking to the Lord in what we call prayer. Inner dialogue is a worldly concept. Prayer is a divine concept. When you start talking to yourself, you'll know you're on a spiritual journey when you're talking to the Lord and it's called prayer. And that's the prayer without ceasing. And it's the inner dialogue change. And people, you've got to get on the stick. You've got to get on the, the stick on this stuff. Enough's enough. Let's pray. I'm going to ask everybody just in silence of your own life to make a little prayer. This message has touched your life in some way. I want you to have a prayer, just a moment of personal time with the Lord about some things. And I want you to pray for somebody else that you know life needs to be changed. I want you to pray for yourself and the changes that need to be made in your life. Some of the things have been exposed during this time. So, Father, we're thankful for it tonight. Pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth through our life and convictions where convictions need to be done. And may we have the good sense that it's a simple process of recovery, but it's a steady. So putting off, putting on, and keeping the on, on. For we made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.